Nature. Hosh Omadid, welcome to this first day, to this day of a live stream here at the channel of Les Plumas de Seymour. How are you? Chekhabar, Khubi, are you okay? My name is Plumas and I'm going to be your host for the rest of the afternoon, evening, whatever time estimated that is on your zone. I'm a little bit buzzy, like my head's not <laughs> working properly because the time zone changed recently and I'm just... I'm at a bit of adjusting. Hello, Roma! Oh my god, my favorite Roman friend is here. So that means we're blessed. Either cursed or blessed. Nah, joking, just kidding. It's always great to see some friends pop by. And it's been a while since the last time I saw this person on Twitch. Maybe they'll be coming back soon with more exciting content. How are you? Apologies for the delay of uh, last week. There were some... There were some unpredictable changes in my personal life and I had to take the week off. I There was just no possibility for me to live stream, but thank you so much for your understanding and patience. Now I am back, so despite what in November now, what we are doing today is a live stream we had pending from October, which is the wonders of creation, which we will cover in just a minute. But before the there's few things I would like to address, few things that I would like to mention here. First and foremost, thank you to my patrons, especially those of Tiara Murshid and Ashdod, because they are the backbone of this project and they are a wonderful support and dear, dear patrons, I could not do this without you. So thank you for that. Always, if you wish to support the project, you can go find Las Plumas de Simul on Patreon and I'm pretty sure we have a tier that would accommodate both your needs and wishes. So feel free to check that one out. And... Um, that was a uh, first thing and then I wanted to tell you that now our Discord server went public and this is because after much thinking, if you follow me on Instagram you've seen this already, but after much thinking I decided to sort of quit, but not quite, um, I decided to quit my at least two posts. Post is a good one. Yeah, let's go with post. I decided to post my activity on Twitter voluntarily because it's a platform that I am not been feeling comfortable lately. I'm not been feeling like myself and I don't think I can take from it as much as I could in all the periods of my life. It's been nice. It's been a nice ride. I've enjoyed it as much as I could in the last years. Uh, but um, since I opened it, I had this, I was very comfortable at the start because let's not forget that if I ever grew on this internet of things world, it was because of Twitter. That is something I like, I for sure, I, I keep in mind. However, recently, and by recently, I mean this past two to three years, I don't like the changes, the platform is going under and I don't think comfortable anymore. And since this is a project that derives just from my free time and this is something I do out of love and um, passion for the subject, I figured that I just don't have to have every social media account that's ever existed. Um, first and foremost, because I, it's not a personal account, it's an account that I use to um, spread my message and to share the knowledge with, um, with the general public. And... Um, I don't like Twitter for doing so. I don't think um, cultural and heritage engagement are good on that platform. At least I don't find a way of making it useful for, you know, share the history or for Iran and Mesopotamia. And um, uh, yeah, that's the reason I decided to just stop. You can still find me on Twitter, definitely. I'm not deleting my account by any means. I'm not that upset at our Twitter, Lord and Savior. But it's just a platform I don't, feel like being anymore and uh, since that is sorry I'm like ma managing the lights in here and that is quite okay I that is quite all right it's no it's no problem let me just I'm just gonna grab my there you go um yeah my I would just say my <laughs> my light let's just say let's just leave it in my light because my lighting situation in here but charm <laughs> it's not <laughs> I mean it's good it's good I mean you can see me and the lighting is it's wonderful. Could be better. Could be better. As many things in life could, but um, yeah, we have, we have, um, and um, uh, and yeah. So due to this change, because I did, I, I'm not sharing anything on Twitter already. Like I was stopped like last week or something. 
you can find my Discord server. This Discord server for Las Plumas y More is now free. And in fact, we have a command. Um, if you, if I can type it properly, that is. There you go. That is the access, the gateway to our Discord server. Um, feel free to, uh, to enter. Yeah, no soy Ros, the same thing it happened to me. I misspelled it, but thank you for trying. And um, if you want to join the Discord server, feel free to do so. And also we have a Telegram group chat. Um, it's not a chat though, it's, it's not a chat. It's a Telegram group where I just, I just use it for updates and announcements and um, Part of my Discord is still solely dedicated to my patrons because after all, uh, being a patron comes with some benefits. Yet, yet I wanted to open certain parts of it um, to the general public because I want to move my community there. I, I much rather prefer using Discord as a place of sharing, of meeting, greeting, a safer space. I I just don't like what social media is turning to recently. And uh, so yeah, if you want to join our Discord server, um, feel free to do so. And just give me a moment because, because I need to, oh, there you go. Um, I need to, 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 to turn off something. And now, on to the hellos and salutes and salams. Hello, Mbocha. Hello, no soy Ros. Hello, Romano se hizo en un día. Hello, Nana. Hello, Sacerdotisa. How are you? Oh, thank you for your subscription. 17 months. 17 months in a row being a supporter of this channel and, of course, a supporter of this project. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bocha. I'm so excited. And now, on to what's brought us together here today. A wonderful book, a more wonderful illustrations, and one of the most interesting topics that's ever been. But first, let me take a selfie. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have that reference. Possibly, I know some of you might, but um, I, I will admit it's not, it's not my best one. Anyway, uh, first of all, what are we going to talk about today? Is a book that started everything. But first, let me address something. When I offer these to my patrons to choose from all the variety of topics, because yes, if you support me on Patreon and you belong to my middle and upper tier, you get the right to vote and choose what's coming for the next month here on Twitch. And when I offered this live stream to my patrons, it was looking something different and uh, definitely it had a different title. I suggested the literature, like the, the Ajaib literature. And uh, then when preparing for, the li for this live stream, I came across an article um, that I'm going to attempt and read the title. I have it here, but it's just, I had not opened it yet. There we have it. Um, I came across an article that I already used for my thesis during my thesis years. That is called The Astonishing, a Critique and the Rereading of Ajoeb Literature by Sidin Bonhees. And if I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm very sorry. I'm trying my best. <laughs> and um, in, this, uh, in this article, what the school did is uh, revisit the term Ajoeb Literature because... Um, this was treated as a genre within the Arabic literature, and the aim of the article was to precisely deconstruct this idea and pointing out the many flaws that they come across when uh, trying to actually conceive a genre that was ajaib. Ajaib, well, ajaib in Arabic, ajaib in Persian, um, they, they have a, a very wide and exotic translation and comprehension, but according to Sidin Monghiz, there is not as many characteristics that are joined for us to create a genre out of it. And in fact, it was something that um, it was used apparently, and uh, well, I, I read the article, I really enjoyed it again. And uh, if you are my patron, you have it on our Discord server under the channel resources. Um, so the... Um, the term comprises a series of books. The term Ajaib literature is one that comprises a series of books that deal with the exotic and the marvels and the wonders and that that is almost on the verge of supernaturality in the world. 
And then I realized it was, like, I kind of agreed with many of the points the scholar made. Not all of them. I could not point them by heart. But I remember that I thought, I quite agree with what these persons saying. Therefore, it would be very hypocritical of me to maintain a live stream called the Ajayab literature if I myself discovered that I've used the term incorrectly and I don't believe the term is properly used anymore. Thus, thus, I switched, I, I shifted to something different and decided that, that after all, at, at least in my perspective when addressing this topic, after all, what I wanted to do was to have an excuse to speak of one of the books that changed, they were game-changing, which are, this book was game-changing for my life and my my trajectory as a professional as a, and as a scholar, and I wanted to talk about this book. Thus, I thought, I'm just going to pause the Ajoeb literature thing. I'm not going to be talking about that anymore. Rather, I'm going to be talking about the book that coined and baptized this genre, which is the Ajoeb of Mahlukat. And, and, that's the reason I have here my trusty companion. This book is called The Wonders of Creation and Singularities of Painting, and it's a study by Stefano Carboni of a manuscript, an illustrated manuscript of the Ajayvan Mahlukat that you can find in the British Library in London is the O, -O R as in Oriental 14140. And I had the opportunity to see this manuscript, at least some pages of it, because the pages are detached, unfortunately they're not together, they're not tied together, and I will explain to you why in a brief minute. Um, but I had the chance to work with it because, as you can imagine, there are some magical birds hidden in this book. Not hidden, waiting, rather. Yeah, waiting to be discovered in this book. So, here we are. Here we find ourselves talking about the wonderful wonders of creation. Let's just overview, like, do a little overview on the subject of this kind of works. And I'm going to attempt... <laughs> I'm going to attempt, uh, I'm going to try my best to read um, the title in Arabic because I don't know if you know this. I studied Arabic for four years, was it? Yeah, like around four years, roughly. But then I studied Persian. I merged into Persian and my Persian eliminated most of my Arabic. And um, please spare me a thought because it's been a while. And um, right, I'm going to try. The book we are going to speak about today is the Ajab al Mahlukat wa Gharaib al Mawjudat. That was not that bad. Which translates the wonders of creation and, uh, sorry, the wonders of creatures and the marvels of creation. And this is a cosmographical and cosmological work by the amazing geographer Sakariya al Qazvini, which, by the way, is one of my favorite people ever existed. This is one of the people I would resurrect to have a coffee, a tea, a pint even with, because he was, and from what I can gather he was just an amazing person and I would love to you know to have the chance to meet him and to talk about his work and how the bloody hell he conveyed this idea of such a book although we shall find that not everything was you know as original as the creator wanted us to believe mm. do you like my mug I'll, why is it sh why is it why this is yellow see the lighting thing also my my shirt is green but it's not capturing it because it's not like a bright green every day that comes by i understand less and less of these um of these <laughs> i don't i cannot even convey a word to mention it anywho let's talk about what's important the wonders of creation the Wonders of Creation, the Ajayab al-Mahlukat, is um, a part of a series of books that were produced in medieval times. That is, we were, we're talking about the 7th, around 7th, 8th century to the 13th, 14th century. They were produced by um, scholars, geographers, cosmographers, theologists even, in the Islamic territories. I mean, that is in, in Muslim regions. But, but the origin of this book is more than it meets the eye. And it's, why am I saying this? Because, let me show you, let me put up some images, shall I? The origin of these books was the interest 
in monuments and buildings belonging to antiquity. And yes, you hear me properly, these books were a compendium of knowledge from the past. Could we say we were, they were doing some kind of historical, archaeological heritage work? Possibly. Definitely not as the ones we conceived now, but they, there was this interest in knowing and in keeping note and knowledge of certain things. And we're not only talking about Greece and Rome as the classic, classical antiquity. antiquity. Rather, we're also including Egypt, Mesopotamia, or even Iran. And the remains of Iran itself, there were still, for example, Takht Jamshid or Persepolis. There was the ruins and remains of the Sanian Empire, of Parthian structures, and much more that has not been preserved to our time. But at that, at that time, it was there. Thus, thus, the, um, the scholars of the time started to... What is that? What? Culture in the Dark Ages? <laughs> I know. In fact, let's we not, we started the season. And I say I haven't mentioned this already, but let me let me allow me to. There was no such thing as a dark ages. The dark ages was a terrible, terrible name imposed to what we call medieval ages, especially in the European. It was referring to European countries because um the Renaissance considered these centuries to be dark, obscure, and definitely, definitely a million stereotypes that we are still carrying on with us in modern media. And I'm talking about film, films, video games, comics series. And it's ridiculous because, if anything, the Middle Ages were nothing but light. Light, enlightenment, and knowledge. Of course, there is a downside to absolutely every single historical period, and I, I am I'm embracing that. I acknowledge that, that is a thing. But this terrible, terrible conception of the Middle Ages that the Renaissance implanted was only to serve their own purposes as we are more civilized than they were. And, um, you know, possibly in some aspects. But definitely, the knowledge produced during the Middle Ages was vast, rich, and solid. And it's one of the reasons we, to this day, can't like have achieved as many things as we possibly have. Um, I wish I was more eloquent in English to be able to, you know, deliver a speech that would convince you firmly and strongly. But take this from me. When I was in, in Scotland teaching, I used to tell my students that that just there was no such thing as the dark ages and please please do not address this wonderful centuries as such because it will be completely unfair and a tiny bit ridiculous to neglect and to purposefully not see what these wonderful centuries produce and i'm not only talking about the islamic world i'm talking about central asia i'm talking about china i'm talking about european lands um so yeah here, here I propose hereby I propose a toast to our wonderful centuries from the 6th to the 15th century. Guys, this one's for you. Worry not, justice will be made in about time. So, the wonders of creation, the Jayab, the Ajayab al Mahlukat, um, was inserted in this tradition of uh, of studying the classical heritage and um, of course there was an important important remnant of the greek um, knowledge and the greek um, uh, content especially since hellenistic um, scientists hellenic scientists and philosophers were on the very like center of of this uh, of the um, um i missed the word i was going to say they were on the main center of interest of the interest that was that was uh, the thing and um the literature produced in lands that uh, profess an Islamic religion, they they started recounting these wonders of uh, construction, but also it merged a present. Okay, thank you for you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> um, they started to compel these books, but not only were they interested in architecture, they were also interested in physical and topographical phenomena. I'm talking about springs and wells and lakes, mineral deposits, volcanoes, rainbow storms, and so and so. And apparently, in the second, um, in in the second half of the 10th century but also in the 9th century is when we can see an increasing in the publication of these works 
And, and the interesting thing is that geographical works merge with cosmological and theological works. And there we have Tabari um, or Thalabi, which have like wonderful, they are Arabic uh, geographers and they have wonderful works on the creation of the world and just the, the, um, uh, the history of the prophets, the, the, the gorgeous. And if you want, we can talk about them sometime. And, um, Uh, one of the earliest books that we have was called Ajaib al Hind in Persian. It would be something like Ajaib, Ajaib al Hind, something like that in Arabic. That basically means the wonders of India. And it was not just from India, as in India the continent. No, no, it was about the Indian Ocean. And it's um it's a collection of tales told um by by a person from Ram Hormuz and uh, it basically are that traveler's tales that makes a bit of fantasy a bit of natural phenomena a bit of what the, the sailors knew saw and experienced during their travels and let's not fool ourselves a little bit of what they believed they saw when being you know a little bit in non-optimal conditions if you know what I mean <laughs> But, but it's in the 12th century when we start seeing these studies and these recountings of marvels, as they were called, and um, is where geographers that just take the stage and start creating these magnificent books. In case you don't know this guy close to me, this belongs to our 1537 manuscript. Um, an illustrated copy of the Ajab al Mahlukat is not the one we'll be seeing today, but I wanted to give this one an introduction because this is one of my favorite visual archetypes of the Islamic world. This is Sagittarius. This is the constellation of Sagittarius. And can we stop for a wee second to contemplate how beautiful Sagittarius is in the Islamic world? Like, not only this lovely gentleman has wings sprouting from the shoulders of the torso or would be like the upper hands of the horse. The tail, the tail is a dragon, it's a coiling dragon that's attempting to bite himself for some reason. In all the versions of this illustration, Sagittarius is, to, is you know, he's performing a Parthian shot, which means he is shooting his arrow backwards. And facing the dragon, the sort of menacing dragon that you can't see um, confronting the upper torso, the upper human torso. And uh, if you ask me, Sagittarius is just plainly wonderful. And um, I can never have enough of this illustration. But I mentioned that we're gonna, we're gonna focus on this one, which is the OR1410 from the British Library. I'm gonna start by showing you this little friend of mine. If you popped by on the Spanish live stream, you already know who this guy is. He's one of my favorite mythical creators from the Iranian and Arabic lands. And um, let me, first and foremost, let me introduce the author, because my God, he was such a character. We're talking here about Zakaria al Qazvini. I have his full name here. Abu Yahya Zakaria ibn Muhammad ibn Mahmud al Qazvini. What means Qazvini? Qazvini actually means from Qazvin, which is in Iran. So, first thing, why is this book written in Arabic if the author came from a Persian speaking land, a Persian speaking territory? This is because even though the native language of uh, al qazvini was Persian. The language of science and the language, the most respected language at this point was Arabic, because this is the language in which the Quran is written. Arabic was considered the most beautiful language for poetry, for science, and even though all the authors also wrote in Persian in their own time, the Scientific books were mostly written in Arabic. This happens as well with the works of all the people that we've known and talked about, for example, Tuzi uh, or, you know, Nazar ad-Din Tuzi, favorite by Nosorus, by the way, and uh, also uh, Ibn Sinam or Omar Khayyam, among many others. The thing is, the thing is, 
Sometimes we've seen use that as a nationalistic claim and it's misused. If you care a bit for my opinion, I would say that is definitely not correct to mix those concepts about nation and language because you are forgetting fundamental um, fundamental circumstances and that is we, we, we should not do that. Oh my God, somebody misusing using history to fulfill their own purposes and follow their own agenda. Hmm. Unlikely, uncommon. First time I see this. Um, anyway, uh, Al Qazvini came from uh, an Arab descended family, although he was born in Iranian territories. And he was a cosmographer, a geographer, and an author. <laughs> and uh, um, he originally belonged to a family of jurists, but, but he rather write a book about the wonders of um, the world. And uh, what we know is that uh, he became a legal expert and a judge, and he traveled quite a lot in the, um, the Levant zones of the Mediterranean, part of the Arabian Peninsula, and a little bit southwards. And um, at some point, he um, entered under the service of the Ilkhans, and uh, most precisely to the Ilkhanid governor of Baghdad, which uh, at the time was Atamali Giovanni. Giovanni. Uh, difficult. <laughs> and um, that was the person he dedicated the book to, uh, because normally what authors would do is dedicate the book to their patron. That was quite a common practice uh, to do in, in, in this time. And um, the book, but child, let me, exp how could I express this to you? The book was a major success. We possibly could be talking, you know, inverted commas, quote unquote. And so we could be talking about a proper bestseller of the time because the Ajayev al Mahlukat was incredibly popular. It became incredibly popular and even more popular when it started to be illustrated because originally the text carried, it did not carry any, uh, any illustrations. And this is where we are going to talk about the book widely and then about this manuscript more precisely. If, if you have not yet guessed who our lovely guest is in here, this is Karakadan. Karakadan is a mythological creature belonging to both pre-Arabic um, you know, and Iranian, that is pre-Islamic folklore. And literally, the name Karakadan means the, the lord of the master, the master, the lord of the desert. Karakadan was a massive and lonely creature. Yes, the armored cow. <laughs> Team cow always present and ready to serve. Um, the... Um, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> oh yeah, Karkadan was a rather lonely and a tad aggressive creature that lived in the desert. And and if you were thinking, mm, this this looks like a rhino, must be a rhino then, you would be, I understand why you would think that. However, you will be a little bit, a little bit misguided because in here, on, in the same book, in the same manuscript, but different folio, we have this. This is a unicorn, an Indian um, unicorn, which uh, gives you a little bit of a hint of about how many unicorns the author, you know, the, the artist of the book had seen in their lives. <laughs> Not many, <laughs> because I, I, I understand this looks like a donkey with a horn. It looks like a, like a unicorn but it's a rhino, it's a rhinoceros. I think I was saying unicorn, did I just realize that I was saying unicorn all the time? I meant rhino. This is an Indian rhinoceros. What was I say? I was saying unicorn, wasn't I? Anyhow, so, you know, this is what live streams come, come with. Um, so yeah, this is an Indian rhino and, and Karkadan is not the same. Karkadan is in fact Karkadan itself. It's a different creature and, um, What's cool as an expert's believe though, and I quite follow this opinion, is that they must there must have been an ancestor to the rhinoceros, a larger one, which would be the equivalent to make the comparison what the mammoth is to the elephant, to the, the to to um, nowadays elephant. Something an ancestor big enough that would relate to the rhinoceros and that was the inspiration behind Karkadan 
But uh, yeah, as you can see in here, they they had rhinos also compelled in in the book. Although, yeah, it looks like Platero. <laughs> it does look like a lovely donkey. But this is a rhino, <laughs> an Indian one. And um, let's talk about the book generally. What is the Ajayab and Mahlukat? So the Ajayab and Mahlukat is a work of cosmography. It's uh, um, a work that comprises the knowledge of this beautiful world created by God. Because that's the first thing to be interested, you know, be interested at is that in Islamic thought, creation is directly connected to God themselves. It's a creation of God. Therefore, the, na the name of the book, uh, The Wonders of Creation, that means the wonders that we can find around us in the world. This, um, this was not an original book, as I said before. Um, it was actually quite criticized at the time because many parts of the book are taken from another treatise, another cosmology and geography treatise, which is Mujam al-Buldan, which is a dictionary of the countries by uh, Yakut, which is another author, by the way, super interesting. It also, it, it is worth knowing this person. Um, and truth to be told, Kazvini mentions at least 50 names in his sources. And um, he, he quotes very important geographers and historians of the time, like even Fatlan. Have you have you seen Warrior Number Thirteen? Is that the name of the film in English? Yeah, I think it is. It's uh, with Antonio Banderas, and he plays an Arab person that goes up north. He's playing supposedly lightly and heavily, heavily sugar coated Ibn Fatlan. Um, then we have El Mazudi, Ibn Hawal, Al Biruni, which is also incredibly, incredibly famous and fantastic to learn about, and Mardisi, which is. Uh, a person of favorite of mine because Bardizi is indeed in my thesis. And um, so that on the one hand, we need to, to give Kazvini some credit because precisely he credited all the authors, apparently all those he didn't. And um, it's basically a compilation of knowledge coming from very different parts of the world. And... Um, it is so entertaining. It is so fascinating to read. It was engaging. It was rich. It was agile. Maybe it was not, even though it was considered to be a scientific book, it was not purely scientific. And definitely the language could have been a little bit more work tone and a little bit more polished. But Casvini apparently did not want that. He wanted to entertain the audience and enriching the scientific explanation with uh, stories and poetry that rather than being precise. The cosmography of Casvini is divided in uh, two parts. The first part is the celestial part and is also one of my favorites because I mean, I'm going to say that everything in this book is one of my favorites because guess what it is? I'm a very big passionate person of this book. You may ask why, why is that? Why do you like this book so much? But sure, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story to chill the bones of a thing that I saw. If you guess which song that was, I'm extremely proud of you and you have an impeccable musical taste. Let me tell you something. This book was one of the earliest books I got acquaintance with when I was studying in my undergrad. And I was fascinated to the point of which the reactions this book awoke in myself were pretty much nothing less than feral. I could not believe such a thing existed. This encyclopedia of magical beings coexisting with actual and real scientific knowledge, with real life animals, real life plants, and this, then the most ridiculous and, and strange and fantastical whimsical beasts and, and, and beings from parts, from different parts of the world. I remember regretting that we were not informed earlier about these books. And I understand when you're in school, you cannot be taught about extremely everything, absolutely everything that is in creation. I understand that. Yet, I still believe that history and other subjects would have been much more engaging if having books like this in the syllabus, because my God. And then 
I also started being interested in mythology, in the supernatural, and you know, in all the things uh, shiny and beautiful of this uh, Islamic world. And I, I found this book, and it was even illustrated. Like, it came with pictures, butcher. So it had absolutely everything I wanted from and, and needed to start, like, to take my first steps into the subject. And uh, keep on moving forward in this path of studying the supernatural and uh, <laughs> in becoming a myth ornithologist because there's plenty of birds in here. In fact, this one over here, this person is Hippocrates. If you know him by his Greek name, Bavi, Persian and Arabic people call him Bukrat. And Bukrat was a very estimated, highly estimated um, scient scientist from the Hellenistic period and possibly you know a little bit more about him regarding medicine and uh, I cannot expand on that that much because I don't have the knowledge and I'm really sorry for, for that. I was saying the Ajayabad Mahlukat has, uh, is divided in, into, um, into parts and um, it falls actually, it, it falls it was formed by four... Oh, how do I explain this part for you? All right. So there is four maqadimat. And what that means is prologue or like pre a like fur word. And um, they explain more or less what you can find in the book and why it's interesting for you. The first one narrates uh, an exposition of marvels what they are and how we classify them and then goes on in a psychological explanation of why the human mind is attracted to the supernatural it's super interesting like why why we find awe and fascination in contemplating the world and not only what we can see but that that we can also perceive with all the senses impeccable then it follows explaining that basically there's two essences of things created in the world they there are some that can exist without their their essence like is how to explain this some some creatures and some entities and some beings or things of the world can exist independently by their essence rather corporeal or spiritual and some of them are just accidents and cannot exist by any means but still they kind of believe they belong in the creation is a little bit tricky that one um then you have a definition of the strange and the remarkable and finally the fourth part just mentions like a big division of how existing things it's like a catalog um yeah what would be the index somehow and then the proper work begins and we have two big discourses the one the first one is dedicated to the things that are above the earth the supraterrestrial things and the second to a terrestrial ones many subdivisions many subchapters many 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 but what we have here what you need to kind of convey in your mind is a line and at, that is the surface of the earth there are the things that exist above the earth but not immediately above and i'll explain myself say that this is the earth this is this the space that the terrestrial beings occupy birds mammals fish plants mountains us humans and then there is the space the empty space above and this is where the supraterrestrial things belong. For example, the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the fixed stars, the planets, the seven spheres, the eclipses, the rainbows, the storms, the hurricanes, all of that belongs in the supraterrestrial area. Um, then we have a description of the different heavens, where all the angels belong. There's an angelology in here, and it's impressive. It's impressionante. Sorry, I had to switch to Spanish for a minute. Do I have... Mm -hmm. I think, yes, I do. And um, in here is very interesting because we have a mix of, you know, natural phenomena. I was talking about rainbows, sunny skies, snowstorms. And then we have stories of the prophet, of the angels. 
it is incredible how much these are intertwined and mixed. And in here, you can contemplate a favorite of many, many generations, a personal favorite of mine. This is Soleiman. Soleiman enthroned, surrounded by counselors, jinn, and angels. Can you find a jinn? They are standing, uh, the other one's standing, this one's in like a very white skin. One of them has a cow head, and the other one, I want to, it's a kind of bird with horns. I want to say is an ibis, kind of for the long beak. I don't, I'm not knowing exactly, but it's a jinn. And above Suleiman, you can see the angels that are about to cover him with this cloth, possibly silk, possibly golden silk. And um, interestingly enough, the angels don't have wings. Rather, the bottom part is deluding in this kind of swirly cloud, which gives them an aspect of ethereal, whimsical even, like oniric somehow. And it's fantastic because you know the angels, but you don't need the wings. I love this book. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, then we have the second discourse that is kind of like four times as long as the first one is. And here you have a description of the four elements of the winds. Again, the heavenly phenomena. This one is much more physical. And then divides the earth into seven climates. Hello. What manuscript is this? How I thought you were I thought you were here earlier. This is the Ajayab and Mahlukat. And this particularly is a manuscript. O R 14140 from the British Library. It's a beautiful copy. Um, we're gonna talk about it more precisely in a minute. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful. It's so rich and beautiful. And as I was saying, the second part of the work is the biggest one, is the largest one. It's taking the Iranian um, heritage on the division of the earth. There's seven different climates, and then describe it describes absolutely everything, seas, islands, every kind of vegetable element, trees, plants, fruits, and vegetables, and then the animal kingdom. It is impressive, and this is like a big, long list that finishes with uh, the human being, the physiology of human beings, the nervous and emotional system, the gene, the demons, and again, creeping things, more animals, more birds, and basically supernatural stuff because basically that's, the, that's the, what the book is uh, is um, about. Uh, I wanted to show you where do I have it? No, this is Suleiman. I'm looking for oh yeah, here we, here we have it. <laughs> here we have it. These kind of creatures coexist in the book with real animal such as the rhino, the lion, the hyena, the magpie, the tortoise, the vole, the rat, and then, then there's the cloud dragon, the river dragon, and so, and so. And so, and now that we've introduced our beautiful book, let's talk about this manuscript more particularly, the one that you can find in the British Library. And here is where I'm going to turn to my trusty companion, which is this book. Uh, I do heavily recommend this book, uh, Bacha. It is Lufli, and it's a beautiful introduction to the Ilkhanid period regarding art, and uh, more particularly about uh, the tradition of illustrating marbles. A gem. A gem. Oh, so this book is um, this one. I mean, this one too. But this book is particularly special for me because this was one of the latest books I incorporated to my library. And um, I bought it when I was in the very, very last months of my thesis. I could finally um, get my hands on it. And it's very, it's very special. It represents kind of a, the end of a cycle and the, the finishing of a chapter in my life and also in my um, academic career. And it is quite moving. It's quite emotional, if I think of it. Um, the dragon looks like it has some strong Eastern influence, precisely because this is an Ilkhanid illustrated manuscript. Let me, let me tell you, let me tell you about this book. I told you it was popular massively popular. It was so, so well 
I was going to sold. It's not like you could go into a public library and buy, and buy this, buy or sell it. But it was massively copied. It was extremely, extremely requested in the scriptorium and workshops to have copies of the of this book, and definitely, definitely was um, illustrated. When and where the context, so we can understand where. Somewhere in the Ilkhanid influence area, that means the Iranian territory. And when? We are not quite sure, because this could be perhaps one of the earliest or the earliest illustrated copy of the Ajaw al-Makhlukat. There is another, another manuscript, the Munich Codex, which um, is in the... Um, uh, where is it? Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm, I think it's in the Staatsbibliothek. Yeah, it's in the Staatsbibliothek of, of Berlin, and that one was um, was created around uh, twelve eighty something like that. And what we know about this manuscript is that the illustrations were produced, and therefore the book was copied somewhere between twelve ninety and the very beginning of the 14th century, that is 1300s. We're not sure. And this is where art history comes very in handy, because when we don't have a date, when we've lost the colophon, and we don't know where on, or when to locate a manuscript, we turn to calligraphy and we turn to illustrations. By comparing these illustrations to all the contemporary manuscripts that we have, we can kind of guess or venture to make hypotheses about where the book was produced, which style is following, what kind of characteristic or particularities we can see in this one that all that share. And this is how we date a manuscript when we don't have actually a proper date written um, on it. And um, since it was an uh, uh, Ilkhanid manuscript, it has a powerful, as Ulukur was saying, powerful Eastern influence because I've mentioned this if you've watched the live stream about the Jamia al-Tabarigh. In there, I covered a little bit widely, like a little more widely, why the new dynasty was demanding a new visual language. And it was one that was taking things from the Chinese art, definitely, but not only. Also from um, East Asian, sorry, Central Asian motifs and taking remainings and collecting visual archetypes and tropes that were existing already in, in the art of the territories that uh, the Ilkhanis were based upon. So if you want to check that one out, feel, um, feel free to do so. And um, this manuscript is uh, a remarkable phenomenon. Beautiful, beautifully illustrated. And let me show you which is the folio I worked with. I mentioned before there she is there she is oh i love this illustration you have no idea to what extent can you can you see why this book makes me go feral emotionally speaking it's gorgeous by the way this is not simur this is not simur this is anka another bird and they are quite different let me i will i will talk about anka a little bit in a minute but i mentioned that i did not see the manuscript but I saw some folios. Why is that? Thank you, Nose Rose. This is because before, before Iranian studies and Iranian painting and Iranian art history was even a thing, people would get the manuscripts, would purchase the manuscripts, and, and by people I mean mostly Western schoolers, traders, uh, merchants, ambassadors, a plethora of different occupations for them. They would pur purchase the manuscripts and since they could not read what it was written in there, but they enjoyed the illustrations, the manuscripts were mutilated, the folios were teared off the original books and distributed elsewhere, sometimes even sold separately. Like it was done on purpose to get a little bit more profit out of just one book. It goes without saying that this is terrible for the books and thankfully this one can, it could be more or less reconstructed. And I say, yeah, okay, more, more or less. Um, although it's not, it's not in its best condition. There are a lot of illustrations that have been a little bit damaged. Some pages are in an extremely delicate state. And um, 
you you do not have when you work with this you don't have the page directly they are sheltered behind um uh a sleeve of of plastic i want to say i don't know if it's plastic or not do not take this uh from me because i don't remember but you are not given the paper itself you need to wear gloves and they are protected by these like sleeves they put on them and you are not allowed to take pictures of, of it and you have a very restricted time with each page and um thank you so much for the british library by the way because they allowed me to have this folio and um i was saying that that we're gonna talk about anka now and uh, Anka is a mythological bird of Arabic pre-Islamic tradition. And it is quite different from, from Simur, although at some point their names were considered to be synonyms. However, Simur and Anka have very different personalities. For example, Anka lives in an island and Simur lives at the top of Mount Damavand. Anka enjoys the human presence, whether, whereas Simur it's not fond of humankind and I cannot blame her, if I'm completely honest. Anka lived in remote islands and even though she would not chase sailors of, or go at their encounter purposefully, what Anka did was assisting the strange sailors or shipwrecked and make sure that these people made it safe into the coast. And uh, this is a very gentle bird extremely powerful she can lift easily one to three boats using only her talents and um, she has the ability to speak and make humans understand her and uh, oh she's gorgeous see but i had to i had to um i had to review this one because in marare a few years later or maybe at the same time Another book was illustrated and the animals look particularly similar to the animals in here. So I would, if I start talking about that, I'm never going to shut up. So let's go on to the images and let's see what kind of findings we can, you know, find. I told you there were, this book is a natural history book in many, many parts. And here we can see the verso of folio 83 and the recto of folio 84 and these are all different plants one of the reasons many that i recommend this book for is because it has a complete translation of this book and uh, it is beautiful because you can consult this you can read the original text and you can be fascinated and entertained as i am mostly <laughs> because the descriptions of some of the books are tremendously hilarious let me see if i can find mm -hmm. Mm -hmm -hmm -hmm. okay in here in here we have oh yeah in folio 83 verso that is the two folios you have other one to your right starting in the upper part that tree with the gorgeous round red looking berries i don't know if those are berries to be fair fruits let's just call them fruits and in here is where we can read what this is about and i'm gonna read you the the translation and da, 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 da. oh yeah this one the one at the top is somak a tree that is and Kazvini says, a well-known tree which grows in the mountains. And that's basically what he says about this. Then, immediately below, we have Sandarak. The Sandarak is a well-known tree from Rum. Rum is the Anatolian Peninsula. And it was cool like that because um, Rum comes from Rome. At this moment, the <laughs> we are talking about 1290s. Yeah. In the, in the Anatolian Peninsula, we have the Seljuks of Rome and also what remains of the Byzantine Empire. Not much, but they are there. Yeah, exactly. You laugh because you know what I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, they call themselves Romans. So the Iranians and Arabians of the time were just 
shrug and say, okay, <laughs> so Rome, then it is, I don't care, I don't know. Yeah, Rome is all over the place, literally. And um, um, then we have the Sandarach, a well-known tree from Rome. From its wood is extracted an oil called Sawani, which is used to smear wooden boards. See, this is something you can also learn from this book. Sometimes the description is precarious, succinct, let's just say, let's just mention it. But all the times they would, following the scientific tradition of other books, such as The Benefits of Animals or The Geography Treatises, they will have a description of the element, in this case a tree, um, a provenance most of the time, and then something that could be beneficial for the humans if attracted by it. In this case is um, the wood and the oil. As I say, it's really common to see these kind of descriptions and it's lovely to see why the trees were valued at the time. This is something I quite enjoy by reading this book. Underneath, the final tree that also has round red um, uh, fruits is called the tree called Shabob. And I'm not making that one up. The name of the tree is the tree called Shabob. And it says, its leaves are in the shape of a small fish. Its fruits are as long as a finger in groups of three and similar to large hazelnuts. In each fruit, there are three black seeds. I have no idea, <laughs> no idea of what this tree is. No idea. I need to give this to a very good friend of mine, Aina, to see if she can identify these because zero clue. Then we move to folio 84 recto, which is the one you have to your left. And starting from the top, from the very, very top that you have yet again another tree with red fruits, we have a chestnut, or as it was said in Arabic, the Shah Balut. This tree is found in Syria and also in Iran. Its fruit is sweeter than that of the oak, and it's not as bitter as a gal oak. It looks like a half walnut and it tastes like a hazelnut. Have you, are you food? It is traditional here in Spain to eating chestnuts and I quite like them. Do you like chestnuts? It is typical from where you come from. Is it typical to eat chestnuts? Because in, in the winter, in the winter times, um, it is quite a widespread activity in the whole peninsula. Um, underneath the chestnut, these pair of trees that have these irregular trunks that are kind of embracing themselves, this is sandalwood, which is, which is one of my favorite trees on earth because of the smell, because of the shape. I really like sandalwood. And Kasbini tells us it is a well-known Indian tree. There are two species, white and red. As for the red variety, its wood is hot and is used to heal San Anthony's fire. We'll go there in a minute. I remember we covered this in the Spanish live stream, but I do not remember what this was. But yeah, Saint Anthony's fire. It is also useful against headache. As for the white sandalwood, its wood is soft and smells pleasant. Let me Google again what the Frank Sinatra, the Saint Anthony fire was. And there we have it. Medical definition of St. Anthony's fire. The intensely painful burning sensation in the limbs and extremities caused by ergot, the consequence of a fungus that contaminates rye and wheat. That was the thing. It was in bread. It was something that was consumed in bread and it, was, it is connected to LSD. <laughs> so... <laughs> So now you know, and um, yeah, so that, that, there's that. And um, mm, lastly, <laughs> just move forward, shall we? And then we have underneath the two pairs of thunderwood, we have the pine, or as it was called in Arabic, um, San Albar. And the text tells us, it is a well-known tree that grows especially in the lands of Rum. Its woods contain much resin, which burns like a candle when fresh. A substance called titran is taken from it. 
Its bark is peeled off and it is exposed to the fire so that the resin flows and that resin is the pitran. Hello! Oh, hello Neferlos! Who's funny like could join the live stream? It is a pleasure having you here. Are you enjoying the stream? We're very happy to have you. So, here you have it. Here you have an scope of how the wonders of creation works regarding to something very interesting, which is plants. I've shown you dragons, I've shown you rhinoceros, and I have shown you um, plants and trees. But let's just go for a wee minute, Bachar. Let's go to the supernatural. Because I told you that in this book, something that quite baffles me and amuses me is the massive quantity of ridiculousness that you can find in its pages. And I wanted, hello Pichu, I wanted to show you so you can be witness of that um, firsthand. And also it baffles me not only because it is the collections of creatures are fun, it's just because the way they are des described a Kazvini could not care less about these parts. And clearly you see here that he's possibly quoting either all the sources or clearly things that he heard somewhere under the influence of, as I said before, not advisably <laughs> things to eat. And I selected Recto Anverso of Folio 133. Let me find it. Yeah, here we have it. Um, <laughs> all right, so part of the supernatural uh, is this. You have a scientific approach to trees, animals, and minerals, and then you find this. This is folio 133 recto. From the, We're going to go from the top to the bottom. And I want to read you the description and just, just sit back, relax, and enjoy, because it's going to be a ride. These are, and I quote, the elephant-like people. That's it. Which, fair, they're not lying to us. This, these are kind of like naked human figures with elephant heads, and... Uh, Gold wings, and um, and that's that's it. Um, and the explanation of the book is: on a certain island, live some people who are provided with wings and small trunks, and are covered with hair. That someone forgot to add, by the way. These people are pretty much shaved entirely. They can walk either on two or four legs. They are regarded as jinn. I mean, no joke, no joke, these were considered as jinn. My God, this is a little bit, it's not upsetting, but it is, <laughs> but it is something else. And, and it doesn't stop there. We have the elephant people. On a different island, we have the horse-like people. These is the same as above, but instead of Elephants, you have horse-headed people. And Casavini says, a tall-winged, blue-eyed people are agile in their movements. There are half horse, half human-bodied. In here, the artist possibly took some liberty. And I'm saying this because clearly this is not half and half. If I say... This is quite an interesting take on centaurs because centaurs are basically half human, half Hose, not exactly half, because the hose, the hose part in a centaur is basically everything but the head. In here, it's like you took that head that you detach from the horse to create a centaur, and you gave the head to another creature that is missing the head. <laughs> I love this book. I love this book. And a little bit lower, the final part, which is one of my favorites, 
What is this marvel? Is this the first D&D bestiary in history? Not the first one, but definitely is one of the most entertaining ones. P2 if you like what you're seeing, I do recommend you either listen to this live stream from the beginning or, or go check the one in Spanish because the Ajayab al Mahlukat is my favorite book and it is for a reason. Finally, we have this. <laughs> let, me, let me just zoom this one in for you. It's, it's just... Um, this is one of my favorite things ever. This is the people with two faces. And actually, if you look closely, you can see the two faces painting in these heads. Uh, we have at least one male and one female standing here. And um, it, Casvini writes, um, some people with human features have two faces and a long tail while the rest of their body is human-like. Now, when we were discussing about this in the Spanish live stream, people commented the possibility that they were referring to uh, Siamese people. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> but this is not... I don't know. I can't explain the Siamese thing by the double head or double face. The tail, though, this is pretty much a lion's tail. Why? Where? Ooh, we can find something like this in Etruscan culture, but I don't know with the same use, the horse dog of wool head. The fun part is that Casvini is noting these phenomena as if they were real. They live in remote islands, someone has told me, someone has mentioned, I heard once they said, my dear lord. <laughs> this is uh, what corresponds to folio, a hundred uh, thirty-three recto, and now we're gonna see the other, like the the other part of the folio, which is the verso. <laughs> and it gets worse. It does get worse. In here, we have the people with multiple legs. And that was a direct quote from the book. They're not lying at us. They're not hiding information from us. What they describe is what they see. And according to Casvini, there are people with two heads and many, many legs. And they're able to sing like birds. And he stops there. He's presenting to you something as unusual, strikingly confusing as this. As a person with multiple legs that can sing like a bird, and with multiple heads, by the way. And that's the only thing he considers important to be mentioned. I've said this, I, I will repeat it. Casvini is one of my favorite people in history. It's like, yeah, big deal. They have many legs and they can sing. Okay, okay. Moving on. To the next one. Oh, this one's this one's a good one. Sing like birds, and if they are familiar with flamenco, with all those legs, it will be a total success. <laughs> oh my god, you're completely true. Oh my god, you're right. I had it thought of it that way. That is perfect. That is just perfect. We found the the very su successful. Ugh, the very su successful. I can't speak. Do, can I say that word? Successful. The very successful flamenco dancers of the Ilkhanet. Amazing. Like I, I don't have the words to explain it. These ones are. I swear. I swear. I'm not making this up. I swear I am reading and quoting from the book. These are referred to as the female people. Why? The female people. Some naked female beings are barefoot and have long hair and female breasts. Not a single male is found among them. They catch Ojo! <laughs> they catch the wind, get pregnant in this way, and then give birth only to daughters. They catch the wind. How many of these infected rye and wheat 
made of bread have you consumed? Casuini, I do ask it. Seriously, I am concerned for your help. What is wrong with you? <laughs> they catch the wind. Les da un aire. En el... Woohoo! Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we've discarded the pigeon. What is going on in here? <laughs> and finally... Finally... Oh no, not finally. We have this one and then another one. Then we have these. These are the human-headed snakes. Because apparently every single encyclopedia in the Islamic world needed human-headed snakes. And it says there are some people with human heads and snake-like bodies. Where? How? Why? See, Kazvini does not care. He couldn't care less about giving a single damn knowledge, like knowledgeable <laughs> bit of information about these ones. There are people that have like heads of humans and bodies of snakes. Where? Where are these people? It's, it's how... I don't know, but they are. They exist. I am just accounting them because I am making a list of the wonders of creation. And do you think this is a wonder? <laughs> they have inspired... Oh my god, it's Heidi Klum. It's Heidi Klum. Definitely. Oh, they've inspired her for Halloween. You are so right. Oh my dear lord. And um, finally, last but definitely not least, we have these... The people with the face on the chest. <laughs> the explanation is brilliant. I love this book. On some islands of the Chinese sea, at least we're given a place, live people without heads and their mouths and eyes are placed on their chests. Now, is this a very, very rude joke about shorter people, Casvini. They're so short, they don't have head and they have the face implanted on the chest. Because that is a little bit distasteful, if you know what I mean. Um, I wonder if this is the earliest human-headed snake in the mythology record. I don't think so. I'm pretty much sure that the human-headed snake has roots either in classical literature or possibly in the Indian, like the Vedic mythology, because snakes are quite popular in there. But um, <laughs> I don't think many people know who Jose Luis Perales is, Rose, but I, I do appreciate the efforts. And, and um, yeah. And this is it. Basically, this is a book where these kind of things coexist with thorough and detailed analysis of species of animals, uh, plants, minerals, and natural phenomena. They just live together you know, in, in the same folios. And it's amazing because they were conceived as belonging to, into the same category. Which, as you're asking me, is utterly fascinating. And that is just many of the reasons I love face book and this um this kind of literature and that is all we are going to cover today but uh, i hope you have enjoyed the um the ride it was certainly one what we could do maybe is just like just read little uh, skips of this because this manuscript is completely digitalized and you can uh, see the pages and look at the images and um to zoom in and zoom out and it's it's brilliant <laughs> so maybe one day we can sit and just go through it and read the description some of them are hilarious some of them are very interesting and some of them are just confusing <laughs> but this is um this is what we're gonna um so we're gonna see today. thank you so much for joining the live stream and remember that now you can join our discord server for free you can enter the community and enjoy we have a fantastic community i am so proud of my bachar here on twitch and there on discord shout out to my patrons because they they are doing an amazing work in welcoming the new people and being just as lovely as they always are with the, per the person that just arrived or the person that just um that's been with us for months uh <laughs> 
thank you, Nasir Ross. Yes, you're local. You can join the Discord server now and you can chat with all our lovely which are in there, me included. And um, it will be great to see you pop in there. We also have a Telegram channel that you can join um, if you follow the links in there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Bachar, for being here and for sharing a new live stream with me. And um, yeah, it's been my absolute pleasure as always. And um, what else do we have to say? I think not much actually. And yeah, just please join our Discord. Thank you, patrons, for everything you do. And if you want, you can support me on Patreon and make sure this content keeps on being created. Go to patreon.com slash las plumas de simur and I don't know, just browse in there. Maybe there is a tier that accommodates your needs and also that accommodates your your wallet because I understand. I do understand, but yeah. Thank you so much for joining me in this beautiful evening. Again, I hope you have enjoyed and um, I will see you very soon. Next week, we have a lot of nice content coming along and I cannot wait because November is going to be looking super beautiful. Thanks a lot to you and I hope to see you very, very soon. And as always, which are create, explore and have loads, loads of fun. Until we see each other next time, I beat you. Hola, face! <laughs>